The coronavirus crisis is motivating Congress to enact a massive $2 trillion spending bill and motivating the Federal Reserve to print an unprecedented amount of new paper money. Is this so-called cure worse than the disease itself? Join Richard Eveley and me in this week's segment of The Libertarian Angle as we discuss that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle. And I'm joined as I am every week by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who teaches economics at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again. Good to see you and our viewers and listeners in these extraordinary times. Yeah, somewhat auspicious occasion here and in the midst of this coronavirus crisis and the ever-growing police state crisis. Um, I thought we would address a certain aspect of this, Richard, which is absolutely an enormous aspect of how the federal government is responding to this crisis, and that's this $2 trillion bailout, they're calling it. And, uh, and then along with that, there's the, the, what the Federal Reserve is doing, with, which it, it seems to me is just unprecedented, effectively just flooding uh, society with newly printed money. Uh, and so we'll talk about both aspects, and, and I want to defer to you on, on both aspects, given that you're the economics professor, and this is your specialty, and you've long specialized in Austrian economics, which, of course, uh, focuses a lot on what uh, central banking policy is. You've written the book uh, called Monetary Central Planning in the State that FFF has published, which I highly recommend to people. But let me just preface this by, by you know, bringing up a, an, an ancient way of curing people back in the olden days that when people got seriously ill they used a system called bloodletting where they would open up a person's veins and they would start letting the blood get out and that was going to be the way to cure the, the person and this was a well-established uh, cure for for diseases and sicknesses serious ailments and so forth and if the person didn't get well right away, well, that just meant that they weren't letting out enough blood. So they would open it up even wider and, and, and getting, um, get the blood out. And, and I read one article that said that, you know, they would do it sometimes with just wood, pieces of wood, they'd cut open the veins and that, it, that if a person was lucky, he, they, there would be leeches around where they'd put leeches on him and, and let the leeches suck the blood out. Well, of course, as science progressed, they realized, well, it's not exactly a cure. It's actually a way to kill the patient. And, and that's what it was doing. It was, it was actually killing instead of curing. And it seems to me that, that that's a perfect analogy to what's going on today with this $2 trillion that they're, they're coming up with. And then this massive uh, inflation of the money supply or what they call quantitative easing that the Fed's doing. I mean, the, 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 the cure is worse than the disease, and it's not really a cure. I mean, we're looking at massive, massive um, debt. I mean, even, even before uh, this thing, the, the government was, was spending more than a trillion dollars in, in terms of what it was bringing in, and the national debt's already at $23 trillion, And we were already, everybody was arguing, or most everybody, how dangerous this is, this massive debt that's overhanging the American people. Now they're adding another two trillion to it. And the, the irony of this is that, you know, where are they getting this money? I mean, when, you, when you've got a deadbeat, which the federal government is, uh, you know, they're massively in debt, they're spending more than what they're bringing in, and all of a sudden they're saying, we got this two trillion dollars. <laughs> really? Did they have it saved away? Was it hidden in, in Fort Knox? Was it buried under the, the White House? Well, of course not. That, that, as we learned from Frederick Bastiat in his little famous book, The Law, the, the government has no more money than what it takes from people. It's not like a producer. It's not an actor in the marketplace like Microsoft or IBM. It doesn't produce its own wealth. It seizes wealth from the private sector. So, you know, ordinarily, the government needs $2 trillion. It taxes people $2 trillion. So imagine the irony. 
we're going to give you two trillion dollars, but first we're going to take two trillion from you so that we can give you the two trillion. And uh, well, less than two trillion because we got to pay the IRS uh, bureaucrats to collect the taxes. We got to pay the welfare redistributors to send you your checks. So we're going to take two trillion from you. We're going to send you back one point eight trillion. Uh, well, of course, they're not doing that. What they're doing is really just borrowing the money, which it turns out to be the same thing. They're sucking all this massive amount of money out of the private sector, which, of course, you know, is private capital. That's that's the key to restoring a healthy society, a prosperous society. I mean, that's what Americans proved with their their system from, you know, throughout the 1800s and 1900s. That one of the keys to wealth is private accumulation of capital. So the government's sucking all that two trillion dollars of capital out of the private sector. They're they're um, so adding to the debt, and then how does that debt get repaid? Because you, when you got debt, you got real creditors, you got bondholders. They want to get paid, and and so when they demand payment, when the debt comes due, well, there's the two trillion dollars in taxes that have to be paid. Well, we all know that's not going to happen, and that's where the Federal Reserve comes in that that's going to be used to pay off this massive debt. And you can already see it happening. Uh, it's standard syndrome ever since the Fed was established that the government goes into massive amounts of debt to finance the, the Vietnam War or the Iraq War or whatever, and then they just start paying creditors off in newly printed money, which debases and devalues the money that everybody else has. It hurts the poor, the people on fixed incomes, who all of a sudden they're seeing that they're $300 a month check is buying half of what it used to buy. And then you get the standard cycles of, oh, let's blame the, the big oil and the rapacious businessmen and the greedy profit-seeking bourgeois swine that are raising their prices. And nobody except libertarians realizes that the Fed is behind this, not the private sector that's raising their prices because the money is being devalued. So. This thing, to me, Richard, is a prescription for disaster. It, it's, it's, this is not going to have a good ending. And, um, but maybe, just maybe, it will cause people to reflect and think about things at a fundamental level. Is that why do we have a centrally managed economy? Why do we have a centrally managed healthcare system? Why do we have a centrally managed monetary system? And if they start thinking at that level, then we've got a shot to restoring a very sound, healthy and prosperous society to our land over the near term and the long term. What do you think? Well, let me start by um, explaining to our viewers and listeners that as we're doing this, uh, it's Wednesday and the uh, Senate and the House are only now going to be voting on this one presumes today after the negotiators have uh, cut their deal between the two in the Senate and then between the two houses. And it has been delayed a few days. And I understand it was partly delayed because Nancy Pelosi heard that the negotiators were planning to return to the taxpayers some of the money that had been looted from that. And she immediately went to her staff and wanted them to check out, was it legal to return money to the taxpayers after the government has taken it? She wasn't sure. <laughs> So, you, you know, you have to get into these finite, you know, rules. Anyway, anyway, uh, let, let's let's put this in a number of just sort of dollar contexts. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office had been estimating before this crisis occurred, Jacob, that for the current federal government fiscal year that runs from October 2019 to September 2020, uh, the go federal government was going to be running a budget deficit of over $1 trillion. Now, with a total budgeted plan of a little over $4 trillion, that meant that already one quarter of everything that the federal government was going to spend was going to be with borrowed dollars. Now, that spending, one presumes, that deficit spending is not going to change. So on top of that, we now have another $2 trillion of government money. So that now what we're going to have is a $7 trillion, excuse me, a $6 trillion federal government budget, of which out of the six, three is going to be borrowed money. 50% of what the government spends in the current fiscal year is going to be borrowed money. 
That is virtually unprecedented. I, I have not looked at the numbers, but you probably have to go back to the Second World War to find a particular year or two in which the federal government borrowed that much money to cover its expenditures for that 12-month period. The other thing that, just to put it in the context, the entire gross domestic product of the United States and GDP is basically a, a, me, a dollar measurement of the total value of all finished goods and services produced in the economy during a given year. It's estimated that this year the, the GDP will be approximately $20 trillion. Of course, it'll probably be less than that because of all these shutdowns and slowdowns in the economy, but it was estimated at $20 trillion. Well, $2 trillion of this extra government spending, that's 10% of the original measured GDP, well, smaller than in terms of real output, this is even a bigger chunk of additional borrowing as, as a percentage of the total economic pie of the country. So, so these are numbers that, 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 that are mind-boggling in their magnitude and significance. Uh, and I think that that should be kept in mind. This is government on, on, on spending out of control steroids, if you will. Now. Let, let's, let, now, again, the details haven't come out, but this is basically a, 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 a feeding trough of an immense amount. There, there's half a trillion dollars, $500 billion, which is meant to be loans, subsidies, supports, uh, giveaways to both small, medium, and big-sized businesses. Now, one of the reasons that there was this delay of getting a negotiation uh, passed and arranged between the two houses uh, was that I believe it was Friday or Saturday, the New York Times had a rather detailed article on the amount of lobbying that was going on. The lobbyists working for special interest groups in Washington were not able to meet with the staff members face to face to make their cases why their special interest group needs money from the federal government. But emails, telephones, Skyping, they, they, they were on high drive. Because everybody sees all this money. Two trillion dollars is a lot of dough. How can, I, how can I earn my lobbying income, my fee, other than getting a bigger chunk of all this, quote, free money? They're extending uh, special loans to the airline industry, to, to, the, to, the, to the vacation sector, uh, to, to, to uh, education. This is basically a vast giveaway to special interest groups. Now, once this money is spent in this way, uh, there's going to be a, an attempt, once it's over, to say, well, you know, a lot of these things, yeah, we have to cut back. Some money will be paid back, like after the financial crisis where the money was extended to the banks. But there's going to be a much larger extension of what government does, how it does, what it spends money on that is now going to be very difficult to pull back completely. Maybe some of our viewers and, 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 and listeners are familiar with an excellent free market economist named Robert Higgs. And a good number of years ago, he wrote a book called Crisis and Leviathan, which are basically chapters covering different crisis episodes in American history. And one of the themes of the book is that every crisis creates a ratchet effect. The crisis comes war most often. And the government has to widely extend its control and its spending. The crisis passes. And yes, the degree of government control and spending decreases, but it never goes back to the benchmark of what it was before the crisis. So there's always a ratcheting up as a residue of the next crisis of what government is doing and how pervasive its influence on the society becomes. No doubt this will be another situation in which this occurs. So, and then the, the other element that, that you, were, you were highlighting is the Federal Reserve. Before this deal was cut, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve and, and its chairman, Jay Powell, had already said that to shore up business, to see that businesses could to meet, meet their payrolls and their, and, and their financial obligations, they were op opening the, the Federal Reserve spigot. And there's no spigot for the Federal Reserve other than printing money or computer money now with the click of a mouse on, 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 on the computer screen, of $4 trillion. So out of this $4 trillion, clearly two of the trillion of funny created money will cover the $2 trillion of the government's budget, additional budget deficit. 
and then two more trillion dollars in principle of just supporting beyond what the government is spending money on, other aspects of what the Federal Reserve deems as deserving and crisis-affected sectors of the economy, down to particular firms where basically the Federal Reserve, as well as the federal government in the budgetary bill, is picking winners and deciding on losers and picking winners in what's, what's an essential industry, what is crucial to the recovery. So they're going to be basically in many ways determining through these spending patterns or easy money giveaways through the Federal Reserve, but the life and the fate of many individual enterprises, businesses, and companies. And uh, I don't hope this is going to be too much of a shockeroo that guess who's going to probably come out best? The larger businesses and corporations. And this isn't the knock on big business the way the lefties do. It's just that who has the power, influence, and clout to try to influence the lobbying processes of where the government money flows. And clearly, the larger special interest groups that give big donations, have the ear of a lot of staff members, they can afford larger lobbying groups in Washington, now via, as I said, email and text messaging and everything else. Don't be surprised if a lot of that money then goes to those groups that have the biggest financial power and ability. Government is always manipulated and, 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 and taken advantage of when it has things to give away. And those who have the closest ear to those in, in political authority and position obviously come away with the most of it. So, so, so this is going to be a disaster for a long time. And then if I can just say one other point relevant to what you were emphasizing, Jacob, and that is where are the real resources coming from when all of these additional dollars borrowed and created for the, for the federal government or just created by the Federal Reserve in these form of loans, resources are scarce. So it's the fundamental principle of economics that virtually any economist on a good mental day understands is true. No matter how Keynesian or socialist they may be, that resources are finite and limited. All of these spendings cannot be covered with real goods and services. What's going to happen is that all of these dollars are going to be created and spent by various and sundry people who have been eating at the government trough. And the pressure of those dollar spendings on the limited resources, raw materials, labor supplies, and finished goods and services are going to start pushing prices up. Invariably, when, to what extent, nobody has that crystal ball. But all other things held given, to use that simple, simple life phrase, more dollars chasing the same or fewer goods means that prices are going to rise. Now, if this continues long enough and the rising prices make people very aware of the costliness of buying essentials, they're going to start, you're start, going to start hearing the clamor of gal price gouging even more than, than there is now. And what then would be the next step to follow up with state and municipal price gouging laws? And the Attorney General has already said he's going to investigate the federal level price gouging. The next formal step of that, because anti-gouging laws are nothing but a euphemism for what? Price controls. And once price controls are then into effect, you no longer have the intensity of scarcity, but the emergence of shortage. That is, at the price set by the government, either formally or informally, the quantity that people want is going to be far greater than what individuals either have the capacity or the financial incentive willingness to supply. And then what is the next step after that? If the, the crisis goes on long enough, rationing. And then the government decides who gets what and how out. And then we will finally be in the world of Comrade Bernie Sanders, who said he liked lines in front of food stores in Cuba. Because rather than the rich people buying up all the food, everybody is in line and getting their equal share of whatever the government generates as the meager supplies of things. Finally, we will have Bernie Sanders' Democratic American Socialism. Uh, by golly, I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right about the, the people who are going to get the large yes. I mean, they, these are not going to be the poor, downtrodden people of America that are homeless and that could use assistance. These are going to be the, the big privileged corporations, the big business. I mean, this is what we... 
libertarians have long called crony capitalism. It's not capitalism in the libertarian sense. In the libertarian sense, we want to separate the economy and the state so that nobody gets largesse from the state. The state doesn't have any largesse to give. We'd abolish the whole income tax and the IRS. Uh, so there's no largesse to the poor, the needy, the seniors, or anything. Everything's 100% voluntary charity and free markets. But given that you have this system, who is it that gets the lion's share to the largesse, especially when things like this happen? It's big businesses, big corporations. That's what all those lobbyists in Washington are all about. That's why they hire those law firms and so forth, that they're out there fighting for this share of this humongous pie. And, and it's a crooked, corrupt process. I mean, this, this is how the sausage gets made in Washington, D.C. And there, you know darn well there's going to be payoffs under the table in one form or another. Um, and it's, 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 they're, they're, what they're really doing is plundering and looting the middle class and the poor and transferring this monumental largesse to big business, big corporations that have the political clout in Washington to get their share of this plundered pie. And, and the people who pay the price for this are the American people, generally. It's just one trans, my, monumental transfer of wealth from one sector of, of society to another sector. Now, your, your point about price controls is very, very good because that, that's what you, you described the, the process perfectly, that the, the, the Fed's job is to, is to finance this debt that their, their job is to pay it off so it doesn't look like, well, the alternative would be to pay off the debt tax people. Well, people don't like to be taxed, especially when they're getting taxed to the tune of $2 trillion. And so the government officials figured this out a long time ago. That's why they called the Fed into existence in 1913, along with the income tax, which was done in the same year, that will raise a certain amount with taxes to finance this this burgeoning, or this, they were starting to burgeon this welfare warfare state. But they always know, I mean, history has shown that public officials get to a point of taxation where they can't go any further because there's now resistance, maybe even revolution. People don't like getting overtaxed. Well, enter the Federal Reserve, that they just start printing the money. And that's what government starts using to pay their salaries of their soldiers and their war machine and their materials and all the defense contractors and all the welfare uh, recipients and the, the big crony capitalists, uh, the big businesses, they just start printing the money that makes up this difference that, we're, that they're borrowing instead of taxing people. And it's a beautifully ingenious scheme. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, when Gutenberg came out with the printing press, boy, it was the best friend for public officials because uh, before that they had to like clip gold coins but man, with the printing press, man, now the floodgates are open for government spending. So, but that has to be reflected in, in the price structure. That when, you, when you're oversupplying paper money like this, the devaluation of that currency can only be reflected by the rising prices of everything that oversupply of money is buying. So you'll see gas prices going up, you'll see retail prices going up, you, you, you'll see it all going up. But remember, when they're injecting this money into this system, somebody gets it first. It's not like this little helicopter concept that they talk about where everybody gets the money at the same time and then prices start rising and everybody's looted, in a sense, with devalued money at the same time. You've got the privileged people, and the Fed knows who the privileged people are. They get the money first before prices start rising, and they go out and spend it, and they get the benefit of that largesse, and then finally, when it all filters out to the people at the bottom, the ones that don't have that political influence, prices have soared. They're the ones that get caught holding the bag. It's like musical chairs. They're the ones that, 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 that get knocked out of the game. And then your point about shortage is fantastic because we see these shortages in the healthcare industry today. We see shortage of masks. We see shortages of, of testing kits, uh, shortages of ventilators. Why? I mean, you know, a free market, you don't see these types of things, but this is not a free market. And this is the point that we libertarians have been saying about healthcare for eons. You've got a centrally managed system, a centrally planned system. And, and you can see that the, 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 
all the rigmarole these planners are going through, man, oh, trying to use some law from the Korean War. I mean, if you can imagine that, to order industries, get more uh, ventilators produced, get more ventilators produced, and do this to get more mass. It's, it's the fatal conceit of the planner. It's what, what Friedrich Hayek called the fatal conceit, because he thinks he's got this requisite knowledge to plan this complex thing, and all you end up doing is, is ending up, like Ludwig von Mises said, with plan chaos. And what better term to describe what's going on here in this coronavirus than, than planned chaos? And so what your, your point is absolutely right on that when prices start to rise, they, say, they blame it on the rapacious businessmen, the greedy profiteers, and they say, whip inflation now. That was, you know, that was used before. And, and so then they, they, um, they impose price controls. Well, so you've got this artificially low price. Entrepreneurs are not going to produce at that low price. No profit in it for them. People are going to overconsume because the price is artificially low. So you end up with a shortage. And you'll recall in the 70s when they had these price controls on gas, gas prices, uh, they were saying this is the cause of the problem. These gas station owners are charging too much money. So all of a sudden there's a shortage of gas. And you have these long lines where we were just like 20 cars out of a, outside of a gas station. And, and when we libertarians said, well, that's because of price controls. Oh, you libertarians don't know economics. Yet you're just so silly. Your analysis is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with the price controls. This is just this strange phenomenon that has hit us, you know, like a virus. And we kept saying, no, it's your price controls that cause this shortage. And finally, one day, they lift the price controls, the lines disappear, and we never hear from these statists again. They never said you libertarians were right. But that's what we're seeing on the horizon here, Richard. I, I don't see how they can avoid this as prices start to soar with this massive infusion of newly printed money. Uh, I don't see any other outcome here except a, a severe price control system. And as you point out, rationing. Yeah, you know, you, rent, you mentioned the, the, uh, the price controls on energy, uh, oil, gasoline, energy prices back in the uh, uh, 1970s instituted by a Republican president, Richard Milhouse Nixon, and continued under Gerald Ford. But maybe as an illustration of the consequences uh, of this, we should use that as an example, if I can sort of for a minute. Uh, there had been a war in the Middle East uh, between Israel and some of its Arab neighbors. Go figure, how could that happen? Uh, and uh, the United States basically was supporting the Israelis, as were some of the U.S. and European governments, in terms of armament and diplomatic support versus the Arabs. And as a consequence, the, the Arab nations, through the OPEC organization, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, decided to impose an embargo uh, on oil supplies, uh, raw, uh, raw oil, un, unrefined oil, and so on, to the West. <clears throat> and... So the supplies uh, diminished radically uh, that were reaching Western Europe and North America. Now, almost immediately, the Nixon administration decided to impose price controls. Prices will not be allowed to rise at the pump, uh, as well as other energy source, uh, sources of oil. Uh, uh, gasoline prices will not be allowed to rise in the pump, really much from what it was, before the OPEC restriction on exports was introduced. Now, immediately what happened was a number of things. First of all, uh, people changed their behavior. And people who, who were planning to go on vacation uh, decided to stay at home or, or, or only vacation at places close by. But the oil companies had been planning oil distribution based upon normal patterns of vacation as well as business and other commercial and home uses. And as a consequence of this, uh, the, the, the allocation of, of, of gasoline around the different regions of the country was based upon the presumption of normal as usual, given the cycle of vacations and summer needs and so on. But now people acted totally differently. But since the government had imposed the price controls and was now responsible for the allocation of oil around the country, they got it all messed up. So you'd have a part of the United States, a, a state or a region, where normally during summer times there'd be a lot of vacationers or other uses, and, and there was excess supplies available there. While other regions of the country 
were in short supply. And that was the lines. I, I was living in, in Los Angeles at the time, um, a, a young person. And I remember very clearly long lines at the gasoline station waiting your turn at the pump. And I, and, and, there were, and I believe it was a maximum of 10 gallons. And what determined what days you could wait online was based upon the number on your uh, on your license plate on your car. Uh, even was like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Odd was like Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. I forget what. So along those lines, people would you what you 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 can't let your car idle. It's summertime to be in the air conditioning because you're using up gas. So people would turn off their engines, just turn down to move up when it was your turn to move up the line. They'd get into arguments, they'd be irritated, they'd get into fights, actual fist fights. And then sometimes you, you'd be getting to your turn at the pump, and then the gasoline station has to let you know, out of gas today, they haven't sent us a new allocation. I've been waiting on the damn line for four hours, now you tell me there's all gas? <laughs> this was not uncommon. So, so the, now, now what, how might the market have taken care of this? Well, immediately prices would have risen to reflect the greater scarcity. Different parts of the country would have had greater demands given the changing patterns of what pe where people were, were driving and how much driving they were doing. So automatically the oil companies with the price changes would have reallocated the distributions around the country into different states. No, heavy-handed central planning delays, retards, inhibits the smooth adaptation of normal market-based supply and demand. The, the, result was, the, the result was that this, was, this created immense chaos in the entire economy. Now, th th this is a lesson, if you will, in why particularly the Austrian economists like Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek had always warned about the dangers of socialism. You cannot have a functioning, adopting, flexible, adjusting, coordinating economy without competitive markets in which supply and demand is freely establishing the structure, the pattern of relative prices to determine where the demand is. What is the intensity of the demand? What would be the cost here as opposed to the cost there? So as to rationally, effectively, and efficiently see that the right goods are being made and that they're being distributed to different sectors of the market where the demand is reflecting itself to being greatest and most in need. By imposing price controls and, and, and government allocations, you drive the entire economy out of whack. Now, who knows how long this for a, a, a coronavirus crisis is going to last? It could dissipate in another month or so, so we'll see. But it could go on for months. And if they impose these type of controls and rationing devices, this could create catastrophic disbalance and discoordination and, and disaster in the economy on top of everything else that the government is creating with these stay-at-home commands in which people are not at work producing products. So th this, this is a road to disaster if the government follows it. Yeah, it's like the bloodletting. I mean, they're, they're killing the patient when they think they're curing the patient. And, and let me just make another observation here, Richard. We, we clearly have out-of-control spend, government spending at this point. I don't think anybody can deny that. They're, they're trying to justify it, but everybody acknowledges that this is out of control spending. Notice that they're not even in one minute way trying to slash any government program, trying to save money at all. It's just business as usual that we just continue operating the government at a deficit and we add this massive amount of new spending on top. Let me, let me give a couple of examples where you could save money. You could, uh, you could bring home all the troops home immediately. I mean, what are they doing over there? They're not protecting America from an invasion. They're protecting the, the, the power of the national security state to intervene in foreign countries, to be the policeman, to be the arbiter, to be the invader, the coup provider, and so forth. Bring them all home and discharge them into the private sector. That would save gobs of money. I don't know how much, but I guarantee you, you bring all those foreign troops home from everywhere. Europe, World War II is over. That would save a lot of money. Um, there, there's other ways that you could save money. You could, you could end the drug war. Get rid of all the DEA agents. Uh, empty the prisons of all nonviolent offenders. You could, you could do small things like radio Marti. I mean, what's, what the heck is the federal government running a socialist radio station for that is a Cold War anachronism? Okay, 
relatively small amount, but you add up all the relatively small amounts and all of a sudden you're talking about a large amount of money. There is no attempt to do that at all. And so this massive out of control spending and their obliviousness to what they're doing, uh, this is going to uh, be worse for the patient than the coronavirus itself, potentially. Yeah, and that, that, that's uh, one final note uh, on, on, on this entire thing. We're in this situation because both the federal and state governments have decided to take a very heavy-handed sledgehammer approach to this, and that is blanket. Only essential industries shall be working. Who defines and determines what's essential and non-essential? Everyone is to stay at home and not go shopping or or, or or going out for any purpose other than essential items, such as going to the hospital or your food shopping. Who decides that that's essential? Now, I don't want to be seeming to be un, unaware or, or, or less than serious. This is clearly a serious virus. It, it has flu-like symptoms, but it seems to have properties, all the medical experts say, that make it potentially particularly vicious. Not on everybody, particularly those in the older age categories who have, as they say, those pre-health conditions. So, so and, and, and you see, the, you now have a body count in, in Italy uh, from the coronavirus exceeding the total number that were killed in China, presuming one can believe the Chinese government's official numbers. So this, this is no joke, okay? This is no joke. One doesn't want to uh, be, one doesn't want to get the virus, and certainly if one has any humanity towards family, friends, and just others in general, you don't want to intentionally be a carrier of them. But the, 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 this, this straight-jacketing approach with a sledgehammer of the government just saying, don't do this, don't go to work, don't buy, don't go here, this is what has put the economy in such a severe tailspin. Now, if, if I can give myself a plug, I this week wrote a piece called uh, Leaving People Alone Would Be the, the Best Answer to the Coronavirus, in which I challenge what the government has been doing and think that we should be primarily looking to the private sector, both the institutions of civil society, as well as the, the marketplace of supply and demand, in both responding to the virus and keeping the economy functioning in some reasonable way without the government being involved. Not everybody may agree with that. Fair enough. Some classical liberals and conservatives may not completely agree with that. Fair enough. But what is definitely happening is that the approach the government has taken is, is, is having a potentially devastating effect on the economy's ability to operate, adjust to the changing circumstances, and will make recovery when you've driven many businesses out of business, even with all these government loans. This is going to be potentially making it very difficult for the economy to snap back. And the longer this goes on, the more difficult and, and prolonged the recovery will be to return to anything like, quote, a normal economy. Yeah, and, and another point to be made along those lines is that you've had decades of this, this system where the IRS takes so much money out of people to finance this welfare warfare state for largesse for so many people that it's teetering. The economy was teetering even before, along with the Federal Reserve bubbles and bursting bubbles and quantitative easing. You've got decades of instability where people don't have a nest egg, people don't have savings. And then all of us, in other words, they're not prepared for a crisis like this. While in a libertarian society where they keep everything they earn, where charity is 100% voluntary, people do have savings. You look at the savings rate throughout the 1800s, it was enormous. So then all of a sudden when a crisis like this happens, people are prepared for it. They say, okay, I've got six months worth of savings to tide me over here. There are a lot of people here that live paycheck to paycheck because of this system, Richard. And that's why it's time for people in this crisis, you know, the temptation is go to the government, look at the government, look for the man on the white horse, give them dictatorial powers, take away my freedom, just keep me safe. Now, there's another alternative, and that is that we use this crisis as a way to do some real serious introspection, some reflection. Where did we start out in this country? What were the sound founding principles of this country? Oh, free markets, economic liberty, private property, 
Why did we abandon those principles? What are the consequences of that abandonment? Could that be the cause of all the dysfunctionality that we now see in the midst of this coronavirus uh, 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 crisis? So on that note, Richard, we'll wrap things up. We're out of time. Enjoyed the conversation as always, and I look forward to seeing you next week. And I'll just say to the viewers and listeners, not merely that I appreciate them sharing the time with us. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Yeah, you just do everything you can to stay healthy and also to protect yourself from the state. I mean, there's, there's two threats here to our, our health, our well-being, and to our liberty. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you all next week.